Uh, and this hadith brings a lot of issues and problems, but there's also uh, obviously benefits for us, but people are confused by it to the extent many people deny this, but this hadith is muttafaq alayhi Bukhari and Muslim, and that is that our Prophet himself was the subject of sihr. And that's something that Ahl Sunnah by and large believes, and other groups deny the Mu'tazila deny this, and the progressives deny this, and many people in our times deny this. But we are a people of tradition, Ahl al Athar, and we believe if the text textbooks say it and the Isnad is authentic, we believe it. So there are numerous narrations in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim that our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Sihr was done against him. And Aisha narrates that Sihr was done on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he began to imagine that he had done something when he hadn't done it. Now, this is Aisha being very diplomatic and appropriate and etiquette. And we learn from other books what was the issue. And the issue was that the Prophet would wake up in the morning believing that he needed to do a ghusl. Means he was intimate, but he had not been intimate. So, shayateen especially love to play with this area of sexuality. And by the way, there's a side point as a tangent here. That's why uh, dreams of a sexual nature, whether a man or a woman sees them, what we call wet dreams, whether ejaculation occurs or not, but all dreams of a sexual nature, all of them emanate from shaitan. And that is why the prophets, none of them can have these types of dreams. The prophets cannot have these dreams. So dreams of that nature, they come from shaitan. Shaitan plays with our minds, men and women, plays with our minds. Now, of course, it's not sinful. We are not held accountable for what we dream and what happens in our sleep. But this is Shaitan playing with our uh, minds. So in this case, our Prophet ﷺ didn't have a dream, but he thought that he had done something natural and allowed between a husband and wife. And Aisha would tell him, no, there's no need for you. And so this was the maximum effect of the sihr. The sihr did not go beyond this. It did not affect the wahi. It did not affect his religion. It did not affect the channels of communication between him and Allah. All that it could affect. And it was the most powerful sahir alive at the time. His name is Labid ibn al-A'asam. We'll come to it. That the max he could do was to make the Prophet assume he had done something halal. And he hadn't done that halal thing. Right? Now had that sihr been done against another human, it might have killed him. But our Prophet ﷺ, the effect was so minimal that he assumed he had done something that was halal. And he hadn't done something that was halal even if he did it, right? You understand? That was the max effect of sihr. So even the effects of sihr were not haram. The imagination that he had was halal. And that's the key point here that the people say, how could the Prophet uh, be mas'hur sihr? Well, read and understand. That subhanAllah, the max impact that he had was that he imagined or he thought he had done something halal. And that's halal for a man and a wife to do. So, Aisha says that he made dua to Allah and he made dua and he made dua to Allah. Then he said to me, he's speaking to Aisha, that I feel that Allah has inspired me how to cure myself. Because I saw a dream that two angels came, two people or two angels came, and one of them sat at my head and the other sat at my feet. And the two began having a conversation. So the first said, what is the problem of this man? The second res responded, he has been mas'hur. Sihr has been done on him. The first said, who has done the sihr? The second said, Labid ibn al-A'asam. Pause here. Labid ibn al-A'asam was the sahir of Medina. He was the most powerful sahir that everybody would come to. And he was uh, a, one of the Yehudi tribes of Medina. And he was well known for his uh, sihr. So the first one said, how did he do it? What material did he use? The other one replied, he used a comb and the hair that had been gathered on the comb and the outer skin of the pollen of the male date palm. This is one word in Arabic, but we don't have an English equivalent. So there's a male organ of the date palm. There's a shell. And so he put some type of sihr inside this uh, shell. The first one said, where is the sihr? And the second one said, it is in the well of Darwan. It is in the well of 
Dharwan. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to the place of Dharwan and he returned and he said to Aisha, the date palms of this well, they look like the heads of devils. And the water of the well is dark bloody. It's not a water, if you look at it, you'll be disgusted, reddish and, and dark water. And uh, Aisha said that, did you take out that magic with which the sihr was done? And the Prophet ﷺ responded in one narration, no, for Allah has cured me of that and I am I'm afraid that if I take it out, it might cause more harm if the people see it and whatnot. And so the well was ordered to be destroyed and uh, covered up. So we learn many things from this narration. First and foremost that Iman and Taqwa in and of itself does not necessarily 100% protect you from Sihr. Rather it can minimize the effects of Sihr. So someone like the Prophet how can we possibly, and he is the symbol of Iman. Nobody can even come close to him. And yet for a wisdom that Allah knows, he allowed our Prophet to feel the effects of Sihr. So this shows us that Iman and Taqwa in and of themselves might not be a 100% effective mechanism to protect you from Sihr. However, they definitely minimize the impact of the Sihr. So the general rule, the more Iman you have, the less the impact of the Sihr on you. Your Iman acts like a barrier between you and the Sihr. And the stronger your Iman, the less the impact of the Sihr. And in the case of our Prophet ﷺ, we clearly see this. What was the impact of Sihr? The max was that he woke up thinking something halal had happened, right? How is that in and of itself problem? It's just bothersome at the most trivial level, isn't it? Right? There's no physical pain, there's no ailment, there's no haram imagination. For our process, it's literally just like the most trivial irritation. That I have to take a ghusl. Aisha says, no, we don't have to take ghusl. Why are you thinking this? And, the, and that was because of the uh, sihr. We also learn from this narration that most magic occurs by using some type of body parts of the one upon whom the magic is done. And of course, to use a body part, you're not going to cut something off. So the most common things used are hair and nails. This is the most common thing, Yun. Hair and nails and also clothing items. These are typically used, but not necessarily. You can do sihr without them. But typically these things are uh, used. We also learn that one of the main ways to combat sihr is through dua to Allah. Because Aisha says he kept on making dua, he kept on making dua. فَدَعَى ثُمَّ دَعَى ثُمَّ دَعَى So one of the main ways to combat sihr is through dua. We also learn from this that it is very helpful to know where the item is. Because the angel told him the item is in the well. And Aisha said, why didn't you get the well out and destroy it? Which means for most of us, it would be very beneficial to get to the item and destroy it. And we also learn it's not necessary to destroy, to eliminate the sihr. Because our Prophet did not, according to one narration, eliminate it. Rather, he said, Allah has cured me from it. And he covered up the well and uh, uh, basically uh, made it to be, the, the, the whole area was demolished. According to another hadith, the angels recited Surah Falaq and Surah Nas. And according to another narration, Surah Falaq and Surah Nas were revealed because of this occasion. So, we learn therefore that Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas are of the most powerful cures for Sihr. And both Falaq and Nas basically directly or indirectly talk about Sihr. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ غَاسْتِقْ نِذَا وَقَبْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدْ I seek refuge in Allah from the evil of those women who are blowing on knots. شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدْ Nafath is, Nafathat is the females that are blowing. And uqad is knots. And this is what they would do. One of the types of sihr is to take some hair, to take some item and tie some knots and then do your incantations, do your, you know, I mean, similar to voodoo dolls in our times, right? You throw a pin in and you do this. So all of this is types of sihr. 
And Allah says, I seek refuge in you from the evil of those that are doing sihr. And قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَّهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ أَلَّذِي وَسُفِي سُنَّةِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ General seeking refuge in Allah from the jinn. And the jinn are the cause of sihr. So, we talked about three stories. Musa, Sulaiman, and the Prophet ﷺ. From this, we learn that sihr is a reality. You cannot deny it. It's very clear in the Quran and Sunnah. Explicit. And therefore, the question arises, what exactly is sihr? All of this was somewhat of an introduction because I wanted to prove to you that nobody can deny sihr if you believe in the Quran and Sunnah. What exactly is sihr? Well, before we get to what is sihr, let us say what it is not. When I say magic, when I say sihr, we are not talking about the tricks that entertainers do of our times. The types of trickery that entertainers do on the street or on television, and they call themselves magicians, this is not the sihr that we are talking about. That entertainment deals with illusions, optical illusions, sleight of hand that he'll convince you that a ball is in his hand, in reality he's already put it in the other hand. And he does this and that, and you think it's in this hand, lo and behold, he pulls it out of the other one, right? Basically, the type of magic that we see on television, which is entertainment, pulling rabbits out of hats and sawing people in half and whatnot, this has nothing to do with actual sihr. A real sahir is not an entertainer on television, even if he wants to appear like this. A real sahir is not somebody that's going to be doing these tricks of trades and magic cards and whatnot. This is not sihr. By and large, this is nothing to do. This is illusion, sleight of hand, misdirection, modern technology. A lot of these magicians are using state-of-the-art technology even nowadays. And even, for example, Harry Houdini of the 100 years ago was using technology of his era that we now think is pretty backward. But for his era, he's using state-of-the-art stuff, right? Similarly, the magicians of our times are using state-of-the-art uh, you know, technology to make it appear something that you do not understand. And also, I mean, a lot of them are mass deception, i.e., you know, you see things on television and the reality is, it is well known, the audience is staged. They're paid or they're volunteers or whatever and, you know, the plane disappears and the audience is gasping, oh wow. Well, the audience is in on the act basically and it's entertainment for us watching on ABC, NBC. This is not real sihr. Real sihr does not occur as entertainment. So, that sihr has nothing to do with Fir'aun and the story of Musa and uh, Labid ibn al-Asam. That's not what we're talking about. Now, some of our scholars are very strict and they say all of that is haram. And I understand uh, and, and definitely it's you know, not something that we want to encourage. But at the same time, I don't think that that is haram. And our children like to see these acts and they know, our children even at a young age know when the rabbit is pulled out of the hat, there's some type of illusion. I don't understand how, it's just cute to look at, right? In my humble opinion, and I know a lot of greater ulama, far more knowledgeable than may have said it is haram, but you know, realistically living in the society, we're surrounded by these magicians, that is not haram. That is just entertainment. It's, whether it's encouraged, no, it's not encouraged. And I wouldn't encourage our young men and women to get involved. But it's not a stepping stone to devil worship. Let's be real here, right? If you get a magic set on Amazon.com and you, you know, it gives you these tricks and whatnot, it doesn't tell you how to worship the devil. You have trick cubes and trick boxes and you know, you know what I'm talking about here, right? That is simple child's play. And no doubt our children should be interested in more serious things, but that's not haram. It's just entertainment and, and, and whatnot. Um, so then what type of sihr are we talking about? We are talking about sihr that is in our vernacular called black magic or the dark arts. That in our vernacular is called, this is the dark arts. And the type of sihr that the Quran talks about is the sihr that deals with the jinn. That is the type of sihr that of course has been uh, prohibited. So, for those who came late, uh, I said that we had already talked about the reality of the jinn. I'm not going to go over all of the details of that, but just a quick refresher. If we understand the reality of the jinn, we will understand the reality of magic. 
So when I say magic from now on, we're not talking about the fake magic. I call that, you know, entertainment magic. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actual sihr. So if we understand the reality of the jinn, we will understand the reality of sihr because you cannot have sihr without the jinn. The jinn intrinsically go with sihr. There's no such thing as sihr without jinn. Clear? Every sihr has to have jinn involved. Because in the end of the day, how does something happen? The magician has no power. That's why Musa accused them, you're frauds. You don't have any power and you know that. You're lying. The magician pretends that he has power. In reality, the power of the magician is nothing other than the physical, natural services of the jinn. So if we understand what the jinn are naturally capable of, and we understand that the jinn have for some reason, what that reason is we'll talk about now, agreed to help the magician, we will understand that magic is nothing other than what the jinns are naturally capable of doing. There's no supernatural, there's no mystical, there's no semi-divine. The jinns are not all powerful. Rather, Allah has given them strengths that He has not given us. And He has given us strengths that He has not given them. So when the magician utilizes the strengths of the jinn, we don't have to be astonished and amazed and say, Oh my God, how did he do that? Rather, just like we can see a man galloping on a horse at MashaAllah Tabarakallah. How fast does a horse gallop? I have no idea. 40 miles an hour? I don't know. 40, 50 miles an hour, right? Now, imagine if we saw the man galloping on a horse, right? Would we say, MashaAllah, how did he do? We know a horse goes 50 miles an hour. What's so big deal? Correct? Now, imagine if we couldn't see the horse and we saw the man going that fast. <laughs> we would be pretty freaked out, right? But once we understand that it's just the jinn doing it, nothing supernatural. Now, when I say nothing supernatural, for the jinn, it's not supernatural. For us, from our world, it's supernatural. For our world, but not for the jinn. For the jinn, it's totally natural. And so if we understand the physical and psychological nature of the jinn, we will understand magic completely. And wallahi, we will not fear it anymore. Because it is ignorance that causes us to fear this. We will not fear it at all any more than we fear a predator. Yes, if we see a snake, I will be scared. But that's a natural fear. Okay, so if we discover magic, we should also, some of us might feel a natural fear. But there should not be a fear of the unknown or unknown. It's just that it's bewildering for us because we cannot see the jinn. We cannot see it. That's why it throws everything into confusion. If we could see the jinn, we would fear it like we fear a beast. Like we fear a, a predator. Like we fear, but because we cannot, our fear becomes mystical. And sometimes even borders on shirk or beyond what it should be, and that's a problem.